Hi, this is Andrew, and this is Keynote, the daily now.tv chat show with some of the world's leading thinkers and writers. Hello, everybody. It is Saturday, March the 30th, 2024. We've done so many shows on the need to disrupt politics in the United States. Uh, it's archaic. It's run by old people and lots of ideas about changing everything. My guest today on the show has already disrupted one industry. He's known as the enfant terrible of the art world. He has many enemies and some friends in the art world, and he just ran with not a great deal of success, but quite a lot of energy and noise uh, for Congress in California. Is Senate, it? Senate, Senate. I ran for the Senate. Senate. Oh, whoops, yeah. Stefan, I've already got it wrong. You... Stefan uh, Simkovic yep. uh, no. ran for United Sta United States Senate. My delusions are are, are, are are like Don Quixote's. They're 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 bigger than the Congress. And not only your your delusions are bigger than the number of people who voted for you. Got 0.24 percent of the votes, but it's still got a lot of press, particularly in the art world. Uh, Stefan is talking to us from Malibu, uh, one of uh, the places he lives in the Los Angeles. Uh, area uh stefan i got i got twelve thousand three hundred votes which which even though i got 0. 0.24 i can't even believe twelve thousand people voted for me so i, I for me I, i'm like that's an unimaginably large amount of people so i'm i'm, I'm i was i was happy well the art world uh probably most of the votes came from the art world art review talked about you as an art collector running for u.s senate uh art forum talked about you aiming for diane feinstein's uh, see, so the art world was aflame. Why do you think you got so much press from the art world for your Senate bid? Well, well, for, because very few people like would would run openly as a Republican for United States Senate. Like, and and it actually does take a little bit of work. I'm very proud to say that I did only spend thirty five hundred dollars on my campaign, which you know for twenty twelve thousand votes is about thirty cents a vote. Whereas Adam Schiff spent like twenty dollars a vote, so I'm kind of proud about my my. Were you at Stanford with Schiff? I know he was another Stanford grad. No, no, I didn't know him. I, I I honestly know nothing about like very little about the system. Um, I think the art world wrote about it because what else are they going to write about? No one's doing anything that interesting in the art world. They go to another fair and they're basically joining a board of a museum. Or art world news is when a rich guy decides to sell a Basquiat. You know, I mean, like, I mean, it's boring. And I, and and I think it, you know I think people in the art world, you know, like to you know like me to be the sort of caricature of evil or badness. So running as a Republican gave them something to write about about me being bad or evil. As, as I well. mean, the Daily Mail wrote about you saying that you were um, the Sith Lord of the art world. What have you done, Stefan, in the art I'm, world to piss some I mean, with, 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 all, with all respect to the Daily Mail, that's not writing. That's an AI bot basically taking taking information and coming up with something. If, I wouldn't, I would not. Yeah, we don't, I don't think this show has a great deal of respect for the Daily Mail. But what have you, in all seriousness, Stefan, what have you done to piss off so many people in the art world? Um, the Wall Street Journal had a big piece about you uh, saying the art world loves to hate him. The New York Times magazine uh, had another big piece about you talking about your your battles with the art world. What is it that you've done to piss them off so much? I mean, you know, oh God, I think I speak fast. I think fast, and I, 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 and my approach has always been different. Um, the art world has a set of rules, like a rule book. You know, you do this, then you do this, you do this, and you behave a certain way. I think my approach has been instead of coming through the front door, I've, I've just gone in through the back entrance, and I think people don't like that. Um, I mean, I don't want to get too serious, but like this might sound, you know, I, I, I never even like saying this, but a friend of mine recently told me that there are three kinds of Jews. There's the money Jew, the sex Jew, and the book Jew. And and she said, you're the money Jew. And I think it's always been something that I've... Maybe again, the money Jew, the... Sex Jew, and the book Jew. And what am I? I don't know. You got to figure. I don't know you. Uh, well. You're you're the Jew expert. So, so so I'm allegedly the money Jew, and and I think the caricature of the money Jew is this sort of greedy, you know, money hungry 
person. And I think because I've discussed money so openly in relationship to the art business and tried to deconstruct the relationship between distribution, production, and capital, as well as social capital, I think my, my open discussions about money have, have irritated the art world. Is Which, it impolite? I mean, in your interesting foreign policy piece, you argued uh, in the interview that um, you're hated in the art world because you're Jewish. You, you said, I speak about money openly in art. I'm the money Jew. Is that true? I, mean, I, don't, know if, I don't know if it's true. I think, there, I think, I think, I think, we think racism, sexism, anti-Semitism, they're all things that no one consciously will admit to, to, to being. But I think people people subconsciously are in, in the way they've... So I don't like to say, yes, it's anti-Semitic, but potentially it is. Um, I mean, isn't that a bit a bit unconvincing, Steph? And we did a show, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the work of the art historian Charles Delheim. He had an interesting book out, Belonging and Betrayal, How Jews Made the Art World Modern, talked about the Jewish role in in the art business. I mean, it's, it's, it's a piece of history. Very. They, they, I mean, they did, they're very powerful. So, I mean, I, I don't want to count up the number of Jews in the, in, in, in the art business, especially in Los Angeles, but I'm guessing there's quite a high proportion. There, there are, and they're very active. I'm not going to say that it's, it's, I'm not going to, it doesn't mean that anti-Semitism has not prevented Jews from become, becoming successful in various industries, but it's been, it, it, it helps, it helps people be critical of it. But I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't think it's an overarching anti-Semitism. You know, I've, people always ask me this question: Why you? Why? Why do you have this role? I think it's maybe the way I speak, the speed, the aggression. Um, I don't fully understand it because, unlike many people I know who have good reputations, I pay my bills on time. If I say I'm going to do something, I do it. Um, I, you know, I, I'm very, very transparent, maybe too transparent in, in how I operate. Um, and I think people don't like that. I think I think people want to uphold the myths of the business because it's it suits them. It suits but what have you done? I mean, according to the New York Times magazine, I'm quoting them. They say critics charge that you often prey on vulnerable young artists without gallery representation. Some say without talent and buys up huge quantities of their work, then flips the pieces back and forth at escalating prices among a cultivated group of buyers, a network of movie stars, professional poker players, orthodentists, oi, I don't know about orthodentists, nightclub promoters, financiers, football players, and corned beef magnets. It's almost a parody, uh, Stefan. Is there any truth to that? Do you know corned beef magnates and orthodentists? I, I know orthodox. My orthodox was at my dinner at dinner last night. Miriam Majani, she's fantastic, a nice, lovely Persian woman, super successful. Um, I would love to know a corned beef magnet. If well, if there are any corned beef, but in all seriousness, what, what what do they mean? I mean, you're not, obviously not going to acknowledge that you prey it's, it's, on younger it's, artists, it's, but are you a, buying up? What are you doing that's different from the traditional art world? I'm actually buying the art. First of all, that's a hit job. At the New York Times, you know, made by, you know, it's it is. It's that's not journalism. That's a hit job. Um, I'm actually buying art from artists who have no markets, no careers, people who are unknown, people who sometimes, you know, I buy a lot all over the world. Sometimes people barely have food on the table. So I think it's a very good thing. Uh, you know, when you when, when you provide capital to people who are vulnerable, so they can actually follow their dreams. I, I reckon that's. Uh, that's a good thing. Um, the New York Times clearly wanted to pay to Porter, but look, look, look at the coverage, the art coverage the New York Times does. Most of it goes to Gagosian, Hauser, Pace. They uphold the institutions that are central and powerful, have the most capital. That's what they write about. So a guy like me comes comes along, and 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 they and they do this. They write the fiction. So the, the traditional, let's try and figure out the business model of the art world. I do want to come back to your politics as well. But for the art world, the traditional role is, I guess, what? There are distributors. People buy art for galleries and sell it to the public. What are you doing that's different? There's no distributors. There's galleries who consign work from artists with no financial compensation. Those artists are not, very few of those artists are provided a, a production budget for their work. If the work sells, the artist receives some money. If the work doesn't sell, the, I, I go to an artist. I pay for the work up front. I, I pay for the studio before the work gets made. I pay for the materials before there's paint on the canvas. I pay for the paint 
before there's a paintbrush to put it on. So I, I actually take a lot of the risk away for the, from the artist. And if I don't sell the work, I'm stuck with it. I've done 75 solo shows in my gallery. I'm proud to say in 40 of them, I didn't sell a single work. The artists have been paid. You show me a gallery that does that. In most circumstances, the artist basically is then doesn't have any options. So what's the... So it sounds good, but it is good. things that I'm very, I'm very aren't quite good that always sound good. I mean, so I'm a young artist, Stefan. I'm, I'm, I think I'm talented. You agree I'm talented. Nobody's heard of me. What's the deal? You come to me, you, you buy all my art, a certain amount. Do you want an exclusive? It really depends. It depends on the situation. It depends how much capital I put in. Um, Usually, I'll just buy a few works and see if I like it and what happens. It, you know, it's it, you know, and and sometimes I, I buy everything. Um, buying everything is not a great business, though, because it's very expensive and it's a huge emotional and financial commitment. But there are artists. Um, there are a handful of artists who I have worked with for a long time who I do that. Corpore is one of them. Petra Courtright is another. Uh, Sergio Tukwekloti in Ghana is another. And those are deep relationships. I don't necessarily buy everything, everything, but everything that happens or gets sold, I have a sort of say in it. I don't have contracts or agreements with artists. I have understandings. Um, so those relationships can be broken or ended by either me or the artist at an at-will basis. Um, and I think this is important because I think the, the, the notion of transparency and communication and and should always be present. I don't believe in in in... In, in having complex contracts with artists. I think it's, it, it's I, I don't think it's appropriate. I don't think it makes sense. Um, my relationships, my long-term relationships are really based on trust. And if there's problems, we have a discussion, we might have an argument, but they get resolved in a way where, where, where you have trans, tra total transparency. The artists know exactly what I'm selling to, who I'm selling it to, if they want. Um, but it usually begins, there's all different kinds of deals because sometimes I might just want to buy five works from an artist sometimes 10 it, it really depends sometimes an artist is not fully developed enough so I just want to give them some capital and see if that capital helps them make better work so you're like a, a VC of the art world you're taking bets on artists I think I, I think that's a I think that's appropriate I think that's a like a VC and then as the artist develops I become a manager I become uh, you know I have a gallery but yeah, I would say that's on a. Well, that's you know, myself. publishers do the same with writers. They sometimes give them two or three book deals if they think they're talented. Uh, music labels do the same thing. Movie studios. Why is this so controversial within the art world? You know, there are myths around art and art production and art exhibition, whereby you know artists are not controlled by someone or artists are free. You know, I I I I I've stopped thinking about like why it's controversial i'm just on my mission and uh and growing my business and figuring out how to how to stay in business and support us I, I, you know what other people think is you know they'll need they, the art world needs a psychologist to figure out why they why why they have such a r relationship with me well you are the enfant terrible for better or for worse of the art world and, and and you ran for senate not without success but with a lot of with a lot of visibility is the the, the business of politics, Stefan, similar to the art world, stuffy, close shot, monopoly, reactionary. A hundred percent. I think I, I think the art world is a political system. I think the art world runs on both money, financial money, and also social capital. I think there are a lot of mirrors between Hollywood, between the political system, between the art world. They're political systems. Um, they, they don't make the best decisions. They don't make the best decisions for, for the most people. A hundred percent. I think there are a lot of parallels in it. I think the art world is much more democratic and liberal. I think it's, it's, it, it, although it, 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 it eschews diversity. I think it, 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 it well, it's, maybe eschews the wrong word. It, it, although it, although it claims diversity, I don't think the art world is a particularly diverse place. Um, as far as ideas go, I think it conforms to a, a menu of, of of liberal ideas that that if you're not if you're not part of your you're sort of not in the art world. Um, and I think I think the political system, the art, I think all systems re really need a huge upgrade um, of of thinking. 
And, you know, I entered politics because I'm, I'm interested in politics and life and social capital. I'm interested in how systems work, how systems fail. I'm interested in, very interested in capital and how capital is, enters the system. I, I, a lot of the things I talk about are modern monetary theory, um, which is the creation of money by the federal government, which which I, I do not believe is a federal debt. I believe it's just an accounting of how much money is in the yeah, system. We, we've done some shows on MMT. It's an interesting idea. Yeah, I, I've done a lot of homework on MMT. I don't know if you've come across a podcast run by a guy named Steve Grumbine called Macro and Cheese. Is it good? It's fantastic. Mm, we'll have to listen. Steve, Steve, Steve Grumbine's a sort of a disgruntled ex AT and T employee who, who like many people, suffered the two thousand eight financial crisis, and he's done a really great job on a shoestring budget putting this podcast together called Macro and Cheese, where. Most of the good think not most, where all of the good good thinkers on MMT have been present. Clara Matai uh, has been on the Clara Matai is an amazing voice. Um, you know, people who talk about degrowth, a lot of interesting ideas. The, the the negativity about a lot of the people who are MMT MMTers, uh, you know, they sort of sort of like mm -hmm. so, so coming back to um, the art world and politics. Politics we know from the no the upcoming November election, which is going to be fought by two eighty year old men, is a gerontocracy. Um, is the same true of 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 the art world? What is it? No. You're 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 a you were born in South Africa, so you, you came to the United States. The United States has always been associated with youth and vigor. What has happened in America to create these gerontocracies? The art world is not a gerontocracy. The art world consumes youth. It cons it's, a, it's like a fashion business. The art world isn't controlled by, I mean, I don't know, Hauser and Worth, David's Worth. I, I don't think the art world is controlled. It's, it's, not, it's not a gerontocracy. It always looks, the art world is fueled by, by youth. Um, I don't think that's the problem with the art world. Um, not at all. And what about then well, coming to politics? Um, what is it about American politics that is has created this seeming gerontocracy? Uh, you ran uh, for the for the Senate seat of a woman who was in her late eighties. Clearly, uh, shouldn't have been in in, in the Senate. Uh, we have two men who clearly shouldn't be running for political office, uh, Trump and Biden, who will be running against each other this October. What is it about age and politics in America? And you're a, a younger man, at least. You, you threw your hat into the ring. Um, why is it so hard for young people to break into American politics? First, first of all, I, I want to say I think Biden is, has not been a bad president. I think he's been a strong president. I think he's take, had a tough presidency to deal with. I'm, 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 I, 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 I don't dislike Joe Biden, um, but, but you know, I think it's hard to break into American politics because um, because it's it's it, money controls the game, just like art, just like the art business, like art news is a basket going to Sotheby's. Uh, you know, art news basket sells it. The art business is just a, re a reporting of how money is spent and made, and and this is the problem with with the political system. It's all about money. Joe Biden raised twenty-six million dollars at Radio City Hall last night. It, 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 it really what the news has become is an accounting and a record of how much money is either made or spent. And that's a big problem, and I think the political system—that's all it is. You know, Adam Schiff spent thirty-six million on his campaign. Steve Garvey, honestly, who was, in my opinion, no business even running for United States Senate, except that he's well known and famous. Got was a beneficiary of Adam Schiff spending ten million dollars on his campaign, and he did it so he didn't have to run against Katie Porter in November. Really cynical. The reason is when you put money in, 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 in when when money controls these systems, those who've lived the longest and compounded wealth the most end up controlling the system. So if you're if, if you're seventy, you've compounded wealth, you have power. Uh, you know, I think I think it's I think it's really that simple. It's ir ironic, Stefan, isn't it? That as you say, uh, a lot of people in the art world think you're the the Jewish money guy, and yet you're anti money. It sounds like I am anti money in many respects. I use I, money is there to to help me finance my 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 business. Have you made a lot? I mean, you you own a lot of homes in Los Angeles. Have you made a lot of money? I don't know what a lot of money is today. Well, you know? I don't know, fifty hundred million dollars. No. So you haven't made Silicon Valley style money. 
Well, I mean, I, I don't know if I, I don't know what I've made. I've, I've, I've got art, like art. I don't know how much it's worth. It's, 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 I'm, I'm either bankrupt or I'm rich. Well, I don't you can't know. buy real estate in Los Angeles with, with art, can you? No, but I've made money. I've got a nice home in Malibu. I bought it for $2 million. I got a house in Pasadena. I bought it for $1.2 million. You know, these are not like $50 million houses I live in. I fix them up. I live well. You know, I'm not, I, I don't have huge capital. I have a lot of art. I, I don't know if it's worth anything. I don't know if it's worth a lot. That's the thing about art. You, you can, I don't know if I'm worth, if I'm bankrupt or I'm rich. I don't know. And it doesn't sound as if you probably care that much, either. I care about meeting my financial obligations. I care very much about making sure I can meet payroll. I have 45 employees. I make, I, 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 a lot of people are very reliant on me. It's very important to me that I'm able to fulfill my obligations because a lot of people count on me. I have artists. I have an artist in Ghana who has 25 employees. Those people count on me. I have artists in Zimbabwe who, if I don't pay them, they don't eat. I've got artists in LA with, with kids and wives. So meeting my financial obligations is what I care about most importantly. Um, and then bringing culture to people. And meeting your financial obligations when you have a big operation is very challenging and difficult, and it's a big responsibility. And as it grows, the responsibility is larger. So I view money as a mechanism required to, to meet people. So I take it very seriously because so many people are reliant on, on, on me having liquidity and financial stability. Am I rich? I don't know. Um, I'm able to eat in whatever restaurant I want. I'm able to drive a nice car. I, I don't like private yachts. I don't like flying. I don't like private planes. I like things that express culture. So I feel I'm very wealthy because I look at my homes and I, I wake up to art everywhere. I mean, look at this is the garage. There's wow, art. people watching. We got the garage. We got lots of art. We got to take a break, Stefan. Talking of money, we all. Need to pay our bills and Liberties, a quarterly journal of culture and politics, help us pay ours. It's an excellent new publication. Actually, Stefan, I'm going to include you as um, uh, for, a, for a year subscription. I think you'll enjoy it. You'll enjoy the kind of pieces that run in it. We're going to run a short video about Liberties and then we'll be back talking with Stefan uh, Simkowitz about art, politics and disruption. We may even talk a little bit about the audio industry. Don't go away, anyone. We'll be back in a second with Stefan. News, the noise, there is nuance, insight. Liberties is not just a journal of ideas. It's a meteor of intelligent substance. It's the place to be for engaged citizens. Politics, opinion, substance. Liberties is a triumph for freedom of thought. A quarterly of urgency, of cultural exploration, of intellectual delight, of immaculate prose. It's invaluable. Subscribe now or find Liberties at your favorite bookseller. And you can subscribe to Liberties at libertiesjournal.com. We are speaking with the enfant terrible of the art world, Stefan uh, Simkowitz, uh, from one of his homes in Malibu. Stefan, you recently ran for Congress as a Republican, even though you seem to have some admiration for uh, Joe Biden. Um, some of the politics that you ran on are controversial. In the free press piece, you were quoted about rounding up 150,000 homeless people in California and putting them in mash camps by the run by the military. This sounds pretty hard line. Now, what do you mean by that? Or what did you mean by that? Well, when I think about mash camps, I think about radar and, and like the TV show MASH in the 70s. I don't think about like sort of hardcore people on the Texas border. I, I think the federal government has a huge uh, uh, capabilities and in infrastructure. I think the military is fantastic and has a lot of capabilities to, to meet the needs of the people. And I think we have such a dire emergency in California that I meant that we, we need some creative thinking to deal with these the, this massive population and it wasn't uh it wasn't meant to say we round them up and treat them inhumanely i think it's inhumane that people live on the street like that they, but they want to live on the street why not let them i don't think everyone wants to live on the street i think some people want to live on the street and many don't and there are many people caught up living on the street who don't there are different 
there are different kinds of populations in the homeless population. It's not it's not one one group of people all with the same thing. There's different people and different kinds of people, and we need to be able to, to look at this population and say, what's going on here? Are, are these people on the street willingly? Are these people on the street because they've got mental disabilities and don't have mental aid? Are these people just middle-class people who've lost their jobs and fallen on hard times because of health bills or whatever? We need to sort the population out. And and I don't see any way of doing it unless there's some extreme action. And the, 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 the conversation wasn't about, it, it wasn't authoritarian, it was about using the resources of our federal government and our great military to, 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 to actually fix the problem, to house people, to s- sort out who's who and what's going on, to, to come up with actions for the people who who, who are middle class, who need a job, who need stable housing, to sort them out. And that, and you know, it's really just about using using the infrastructure we have instead of we've got tents and military infrastructure sitting in storage bins all over America, which which could be used as, what, as a- what, what what did your what has your experience been in terms of disrupting the art business? You've clearly successfully disrupted it that might help you address this issue of homelessness in California, which whether or not you believe in quote unquote rounding up people, there's certainly an issue. Everybody agrees about it, whether it's in Los Angeles. I was down there last week or in San Francisco where I live. There's a huge problem. What what has your disruption of the art business taught you about addressing a problem that no one seems to be able to fix on any political side. You need you need solutions that are unpopular. You need to be able to call artists who expect ten thousand dollars a work and say, "I'm going to give you two. and you're going to and and, and, <laughs> and what happens when you do that? Do they put the phone down. Do they scream at you? Well, the, 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 they're like, "I need ten, but the gallery's not giving them ten. The galleries who are selling their work for ten are sometimes not even paying them. And, and they might be young and delusional, but like when you buy, when an artist can produce, produce 40 paintings in a year and you can give them $2,000 a painting, they're making $80,000 a year. That's a lot of money, you know, to do what you love, to make three paintings a month. So what you're saying is you've got to tell truths that people simply don't want to hear and that exactly, everyone's exactly. been lied to or been exactly. told oh, you want exactly. to hear. Exactly. You're evil. You want to round up homeless people and you're a autocrat and an ethno-nationalist Zionist pig or you're a racist or whatever. I mean, the head of gender equity, whatever, and data policy at the Gates Foundation DM'd my artist who I work with for 10 years, Sergio Tukwe in Ghana, asking him why he works with me because I'm an ethno-nationalist Zionist racist. Although, although to be fair, Stefan, I mean, the, the, the stuff I'm quoting from is a foreign, um, is, a, is a free press piece that was actually rather sympathetic to you. I mean, it, it, was, of- it was sympathetic, but this is one paragraph. It didn't express the completeness of the idea. And the idea is that you would use our federal resources that we pay for as taxpayers to solve an intractable problem. I had retail galleries in LA, one in West Hollywood. I closed it because my 24-year-old female employee was not safe for her to be there because there was a homeless person who slept in front of the gallery every night. There was a naked man who came in one day to the gallery. Very dangerous. I've got a gallery downtown. The guy, Jose, uh, Jose where was attacked by a homeless guy yesterday. It is dangerous. Businesses are closing in California. It's dangerous. There, there, there's not like oh, yeah. And you, and you wrote about this, or the free press piece uh, talked about, uh, uh, and and I'm quoting you. You're fed up with progressive politics that have allowed the city, Los Angeles, overrun with crime, homelessness, and drug addiction. I was down in LA last week. Was on Wilshire Boulevard, and there were homeless cities there. Is it simply because people are not willing to acknowledge the truth? They don't want to hear the truth about why there's homelessness. It, 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 it comes, it, well, I don't think it's about the truth. It's about this idea that that there are no hard decisions. I think DEI and equality and all of these, they're, they're, they've been totally overwrought where, you, where you're incapacitated from doing anything. Uh, you've, you've, you've brought up those words, DEI. Uh, you, at least according to the free press piece, despise the DEI bureaucracy. Um this is the the anti woke argument. Where is the DEI bureaucracy? I have to admit that maybe I'm just a uh, a, a, a podcaster, a small time podcaster, but I've never experienced the DEI bureaucracy. Where is it? I mean, when my artist receives 
an email, a message, DM from the head of gender data policy at the Gates Foundation questioning why he works with me because I'm a racist. And who a cares about that? But, but, but these, this, that is a, this is an artist in Africa who's receiving an email from someone who works with one of the most powerful charitable organizations in the world telling the artist not to take capital from me, not to work with me because mm. this artist has stayed in my home. This artist's response is I found it completely racist that she emailed him because he, he's lived in my house for a year in LA and knows me really well for a decade. But I think this the, the, this this thing I see all the time. So 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 that bureaucracy is present. It's in present in the art institutions. The art institutions are beginning to hire curators who 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 are implementing DI initiatives. And you know what? They're doing shows that no one cares about. They're showing art that's not good. They're making movies and TV that is nonsensical. They're, you know. So I think that I think a, a lot of the DI things, a lot of the criticisms that I got about the homeless population was like, you're, you're an authoritarian, but we need to do what, what the art business. A Jewish me, authoritarian, a Jewish authoritarian. Even worse. Yeah. Even worse. What, 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 what the art world has taught me is sometimes you just have to kick down doors, have tough conversations and say to the artist, how much did you make from your gallery last year sales? And they'll say $24,000. Coming dollars. back to the, the, the anecdote you told about the Gates Foundation person emailing or messaging your artist in Africa. So what? That's not a bureaucracy. That's just someone trying to dirty your name. But it's not a bureaucrat. They don't have any power as a Gates Foundation person. My, my, okay, my, 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 my kid, I have a tough time finding it. My kid's gone to a number of schools goes to a school it's doing history. They don't have a textbook history. They're giving him stuff. They have social justice course every day. He's not learning anything. It took him out of a school, sent him to Fusion Academy. These kids are not going to be educated properly. They're going to, they're not learning anything. So what should they be learning? They should be learning. I mean, the history of, of Stefan, the history, and we do many shows on this, of America has been besmirched by racism and sexism and slavery. Shouldn't they be taught that? They should be, but they don't have to be. That they don't. They, they, but they should be. But if you learn, if you study the history of America, you're going to see that it's sexist and racist. But you shouldn't be just writing essays about uh, about critical race theory. You need the timeline. This happened, and this happened, and this happened. AP history. AP European history, AP American history, very simple, structured courses to build a framework that you can actually understand the historical timeline of how things happened. Yes, they were racist and sexist, but you need the timeline. You can't remove the timeline and then just discuss the racist, sexist uh, attitudes of history that, that overwhelm history. You got to You understand the timeline. Once you understand the timeline, you can fill it in. But they're not even being taught the timeline. All they're being taught is it's racist and sexist. So everything that has power is racist, sexist, in unequal, colonization. If I'm rich, I'm a colonizer. If you're poor, you're colonized. It's a really simple directive. And that's what people today are learning. It's not like 20 years ago where a guy would see a guy driving a Rolls and the guy was in a, in a scooter and be like, that's a beautiful Rolls. I want to have one one day. You know, I'd like to make that. What they're saying is, I want to take your roles. You don't. You, you need to be on the scooter with me. Very different America. What's your? You obviously know the art world inside out. What's your take on um, narratives in art? I just watched this week a, a documentary on Frida Kahlo, the Mexican artist, um, and I thought it was an excellent documentary. But I read a very critical review suggesting that it didn't address her politics and her take on the Mexican state and Mexican capitalism and that and th and that sort of thing is all art for you political and uh, the kind of things that outrage you are they manifested in art is there increasingly an artistic reaction to what you call the DEI bureaucracy absolutely they're making a uh, they're making bad art Frida Kahlo maybe didn't discuss it because she was focused on making art that's beautiful art is a thing that functions in its own sphere. It's not there to be used to ideologically fulfill and pursue an agenda. That's fascism. Fascist architecture is there to ex show the power of the state over the people. So good artists are, are focused on the aesthetics that 
that have to do with making art. And what's happened is there are artists who are political artists, performance artists, but it's all become uh, it's, it's all become like oh, if the art has an ide- f- fulfills an identity politics agenda, then it's good. But it's bad art. So a lot of the black portraiture we saw over the last three years that hit the market that did really well was just there pushed by BLM and that movement. A lot of that art is crap, bad. And today, now that that movement is no longer strong, the values of that kind of production have literally collapsed. They've gone from being worth $400,000 to being worth $5,000. So so when art is scaffolded onto political initiatives and onto these political, social, cultural movements and, and produced in order to satisfy the machinery of of, of, of sort of liberal capitalist art collectors, it fails because art is there to take you somewhere and transport you into spaces that politics or, or, or other things can't. So when you listen to beautiful music or you listen to, or, or, you, or you eat beautiful food or you look at a beautiful painting, it has a, its own language. It functions outside of these spheres of influence that are political. That's why a, 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 a radical Republican a radical Democrat, a, a radical atheist, a radical authoritarian, a radical libertarian can listen to the same piece of music and have this and have a very similar uh, spiritual experience, even though they're completely different politically, ideologically, from an educational point of view. They can have they can come together in in the experience of culture, whether it's music, art, poetry, literature, or anything, and have this experience that that is shared and communal and outside of the bounds of their defined intellectual outlook of life. This is the power of art. When art is, is made a, a prisoner of the systems of politics and ideology above it, art no longer functions as art. It functions as a form of fascist uh, communication expression. It fulfills the political agenda. And this becomes dangerous. And I'm guessing then you're not particularly happy about reinterpretations of some great artists of the past. Picasso comes to mind and his treatment of women. Do you think that we should leave the politics or the personal morality of great artists alone and just look it's, at their it's, work? It, it's irrelevant. It's irrelevant. It Completely is, it, irrelevant. So it doesn't matter what they, how they live their lives as long as their art's good? A hundred percent. If their art is good, and, and if their literature is good, if their poetry is good, because then you, then you need to open up the CIA of investigating the moral lives of people. Once you, once you open this landscape, you were rude to a barista one day, uh, or, 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 you, or, or you had a fight with your son one day, or you're a bad person, therefore everything you've done and your output is meaningless. This this is a very slippery slope. When you, if you take it to it, it, the way to see if something's dangerous is take something to its extremes. And at its extremities, if it doesn't make sense, then it's dangerous. But yes, I don't want to throw out Picasso because if anything, I want to throw out Picasso because he copied tribal art from Africa. And maybe the tribal art from Africa is better. If anything, maybe Picasso's a copycat, not how he treated women or what he did or whether he was drunk. or I, I, It's difficult enough understanding art. But how many, how many fascists have made beautiful music? How many racists have composed, you know, go back to, Mo- do, do you know if Mozart was a racist? I don't. Maybe he was. Do you okay. know Ar- Aristotle? You can take the entire tradition of Greek. Aristotle basically said a slave is a chair without a soul. The equivalence. If you look at the ancient Greeks, look at their relationship to slavery. It was outside of their concept in the Asian world to understand that slavery was a bad thing. Should Can we you, uh, uh, Stefan, a final question. It's a fascinating conversation. We'll have to get back on the show. Maybe we can have a, a whole show on, on your attempt to disrupt the, the music and the audio industry. But what about artists, younger artists who you work with who probably strongly disagree with your politics and your take on art and the separateness of art and morality? Do you do, do some of your partners or clients? I don't know how you would describe an artist who who you work with. Do you think they share your politics? Is this a problem for you, or could it be a problem? 
Uh, you know, I mean, I mean, is it a problem? I have no idea. Every time I contact an artist and they ask their teacher whether they should work with me, the teacher says no. Or, you know, so, so, <laughs> so, so, so it's like this has been this way for 10 years. All I know is there was an artist who taught at UCLA, stood up at UCLA and said, if a person named Stefan Simkus calls, hang up the phone. I was like, is 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 this person going to uh, pay? Their I bill? wish I had your impact. Everyone yeah. would. So, so, uh, so, I hope I'm going. I may get an email from the head of the Gates Foundation, tell me not to work with you and to, to delete this interview, Stefan. Don't worry, I sent the Gates Foundation a message already, complaining about their employee basically telling artists not to work with me. And, and how did they respond? And they don't respond. They don't care. I get. I, you know, I work with artists who are very loyal to me. Artists who know what I've done for them. They forward me all the communication. So I receive emails, messages, these, these, like, like these patronizing white people protecting the integrity of artists all over the world. Turia Magdalena in South Africa, black artist, no one supports her, lives on the market. So they share the, they share the messages with me. And I read what these people say. The, the artists find it so patronizing that white people in America who do not who aren't even going to buy their work. So so I'm used to it. So Final like, question, Stefan. Well, let's end on politics. As I said, uh, you ran uh, for, uh, for the Republican seat, or you ran as a Republican for the Feinstein Senate seat. You got 0.24% of the election. As you said, you got a few thousand people voting. Is this the end of your political career, or, or might we hear about Stefan Simkowitz again in politics in California? I think you will. I think you will. This was just me practicing, warming up. 